Here we go. Somewhere in this box of, of duffel cut GAC, there is an 1898 Carabiner AZ, and I'm told the AZ stands for the fact that it has a stack and swivel gizmo with it, and you can plug a bayonet into it. Um, pretty bad. Finishes have been adulterated, duffel cuts have been made. Duffel cuts on this one is so bad, there's actually a small hacksaw nick in the barrel. This thing's been refinished to within an inch of its life. Let's go fix some eight miles or shall we? Because God knows they need it. We might have caught a break on this. We have a ferrule that's actually installed in here. And this ferrule looks like it's in an unobstructed hole. You can see where they try to make the saw cut across it. All that is what that is. And then again, now you're gonna get a much better look at this 1950s looking glue here. And all that's gotta go away because whatever we're glued to, you know, if we, uh, aqua glass over the top of this and it's, it screws up our clearances so then we're looking at the length of this and we're going okay when this gun lines up the right way you would agree that that should be basically right there right that that should line up and we come to the back here and we take a look and the dirt marks you can see where you know, I know this isn't the original finish because even the Germans finish things and then put the metal over the top. Um, and I don't mean even the Germans. I mean, they had stunning uh, attention to detail. So here's the rear. So if that goes there, like that, and then we'll have to deal with the fact that that screw has just had the crap pounded out of it. But we'll run that through there and tighten that up. So hang on a second here. I'll just run that screw in. That gives us a pretty good idea where that band used to be. And then we can run this wood up underneath it until it touches down back here. And then note that we're exactly on the money. So that tube, if we don't disturb the location of the tube in the duffel cut part, we now have a relationship indicator as to how much wood's missing back here. There is a lot of wood missing here. This is going to look a lot like a nice thick wedge here. All right. Um, back down on a vise now. We're going to get in and take a look at this. This, uh, yeah. So I got to go through, chip all this glue off, get the, get the distances right. And then before I glue it, I'll show you the whole thing before I glue it. But this is nasty. Ridiculously sharp tools help here. But there's no way I'm going to be able to preserve any of the additional wood. Bearing in mind, of course, that if this thing had not been duffel cut, it would not be sitting on my bench for us to be working on. So we can't complain about the duffel cut because it's here now because it was cut. So I, I'm not worried about this here, and I don't want to disturb the location of this tube because this tube is what's setting the interrelationship between everything. So what I've got to figure out how to do now is get a good number on what's missing. What's missing? And, and the way we're going to do that is we're back right to our forend piece again. We already know that this relationship right here is here. So I'm just gonna pop a rubber band around this. So I've rubber banded this and we've got the distance set up right up here in the front. So what this is gonna allow us to do is without the band in the way, slide this around until we get a level up um, with the back end of the gun and then measure what's missing. So we'll do it all upside down and I'm going to have to move the camera because this is going to have to be all the way over here in order to be able to see it. I brought the 
part back out here in, in, in the vise. And because we don't have the front barrel band on it, we can square this up and we can see just how much wood is missing right there. You see that crack? And that's a lot of missing wood right there. So I've done this in the past differently, but this one, I'm just gonna glue a piece of end grain wood onto it. When I get it glued on and I get it trimmed to length, we'll drill a hole and drill a hole, put a piece of um, like a metal reinforcement up inside there and then glop this whole thing down in one jump. Let's go cut some wood. Switching our attention to the fore end piece now. This is the piece I'm gonna do my gluing on because I took a, an end grain piece here. This is a piece that came off a stock we were making. In fact, you can even see the angle cut into it. And I want the grain to run this way. So I just band sawed off a hunk of wood like that. Boom, it's a little bit thick enough. And you can see here what we're gonna do. That's gonna sit there. And when that sets up, I can then cut this down to a uh, profile. I can get the profile right. And then come in and just kiss it on a sander in order to get our overall length right. And I'm doing it all in a piece that's only about that long. So it's, it's, it's um, easier to handle than say the entire rear end of the gun. Um, yeah, so we've got some acro glass mixed up and we're just looking here real quick to make sure there's no cracks back here. The bedding didn't fail. Now this crack right here is not a structural crack. This is just the wood drying out and it's called a check and it, it just splits like that. I don't know what we're gonna do with that, fill it in. I don't know what we're gonna do. We'll, do. we'll burn that bridge when we get down there. It doesn't look like a longitudinal split off the bottom end of this screw. If it was this screw, that the, the crack line would be like right there. And it's not, it's, it's, it's up a little bit further. So I just think the, you know, the, the stock's drying out. Um, we don't wanna do that. All right, very good. So. All of this hate and discontent, here, let me rotate this. Let me show you what's going on over here. All of this hate and discontent over here is gonna be hidden underneath the barrel band. If I'm not wrong, it's gonna go on this way. Right, because the uh, sling lug is gonna be on the uh, right-hand side of the gun. I gotta go backwards, it's this way. Um, the top of the gun is up here. So this is gonna fit over and it's gonna cover most of that hate. You can see that tube in there. So I'm really not sweating what this, is, what this is gonna look like. I'm not cutting pieces of wood. I'm not doing anything. I'm just gonna fully acroglass it and I mean wet it. So we're gonna go ahead here and scrub this stuff in so that it wets, okay. And I've got a colored black just in case you do see it. And we are gonna go with solid, solid plug of this. And we'll just lay this on there. Acro glass for the win, right? Now, if I don't fill this crack all the way up, I'll come back and do it again on the second glassing when we glue the two pieces together. Trick here to note is, is that you're not in an, you're not in a hurry. You do not have to do all six of these evolutions at once. You just go ahead and get that in there and fill that in nice and smooth. And there's gonna be some stuff missing here, but we'll go back and get it. Cause this is a lot to fill up right here. That's a big missing piece. We'll fill it in later. One of the beauties of Acroglass is that it can stick to itself. Okay, so that's gonna roll on there. Whenever you're joining two pieces together, you gotta wet both sides. You gotta butter both sides of this. And you can see here from the darkness, it does soak in, right? So there is actually chemical getting in down under into the pores and making this a much stronger glue joint. Okay, so we'll just do that. We'll roll this up and we'll just stick this bad boy on here. After consulting with a lot of people that know what they're talking about, Devin and Bruno and, and uh, Ben and a bunch of guys that get this 
World War II, or World War II, geez, World War I stuff on a level that I don't get it on. Um, after talking to them, it's very obvious that this is somebody's attempt to brush on some kind of polyurethane back in the 50s or the 60s. So we're going to make this go away. And I would mention one thing in the middle of all this. If you guys are interested in the Carabiner uh, 98AZ, go to uh, episode 005 star at um, uh, C and Arsenal, and they have a beautiful historical representation of this gun that I'm not going to give you. All I know is that this particular one was hurting. So again, we have a scraper here. And I'm just going to show you that the scraper has a sharpened edge on it right back there. It has a slight, you can see that silver barrel in it right there. I've sharpened that and I'm trying not to hang on to this too tight because I don't want to snap it. You know, let's get this in there right. And I'm not trying to take the wood off this. All I'm trying to do is get this nasty finish off the top of it. Now we're going to do this to the rest of the stock. I will tell you that. Let me get the light on here better. Here we go. That shows it a lot better. We're going to do the rest of the stock, but it just made sense to show you what the forend looks like and what it shouldn't look like. And I'm going to give you an example of what it shouldn't look like. And I'm going to bring this. I'm going to bring this thing back up here, this other carabiner, and take a look at this. And you can see that this finish, my God, the Swiss didn't do guns this nice. This thing has been sanded and oiled in whatever to within an inch of its life, and it's absolutely smooth. And don't believe, even the Germans aren't that anal about this, man. They didn't have the time. These things had a coat of oil put on them, and they were sent out. So if you see one of these things, and it's smooth like this and shiny, that isn't right. I mean, here, here we go. Hang on. Here we go. This is a P14. Um, and it, I'm telling you, man, this thing got put together in a hurry. Look at this. You can actually still see the draw knife marks. I mean, they didn't, they didn't take a lot of time on this. And I'll tell you straight up, this, this particular piece of equipment has not been adulterated. Okay, and it's it's definitely British. It's got British proof marks all over it. Um, and they were in a hurry. And if you look at this, none of these pores have been filled. Okay, this thing was dipped in a tub of oil once, twice, if it was being blessed by the gods. And that's it, and off it went. So we're trying to make sure that we don't create that look. Back to the light scraping. What I'm making here for sawdust, Bruno, give me a zoom right here, will you? Right here on my, yeah, there you go. So what we're making here, this is not sawdust. This is actually powdered whatever this gack is on the top. We don't want to open, uh, we don't want to make the wood naked if we can get away with it. We don't want to be taking off any um, inspector's marks, any unit marks. All we're doing is very, very, very lightly removing the outer finish. And I'm going to tell you, there's enough oil in this thing that if I run my thumb on this hard enough, the color will actually start to come down a little bit. I'm actually burnishing it with my thumb. So you have a lot to work with here without um, completely messing this up. We're not going to use a lot of sandpaper on it. This is a 150 grit, and I'm not pressing very hard. All we're doing very, very lightly running this. Now, if there's a lot of oil in this, this sandpaper will start to crap up. If there's a lot of oil in it, we're getting lucky here. Now, notice what I'm not doing. I'm not sanding every one of these little character marks off of this. This gun's a hundred and something years old. It was used in a war, probably. And we just gotta, we gotta respect that, I think. 
get the sharp edge. And again, you can tell there's a shadow line. There's a shadow line right there. You can actually see the umbra as we're working this back and forth. You know, I've been accused of freehanding a lot of this, and I do freehand a lot of it, but I'm not working totally without a net. I like a net, and uh, she doesn't like being worked without. So we'll do this upper part lightly sand. You see how much effort I'm putting in this. I'm not really killing myself here. Okay. I'll hear people saying, well, you're supposed to get this wet and fur it up. I really don't want to get it wet and fur it up. What I want to do is take a little bit of this and what we want it to do is not be oh dear god don't get this stuff on your fingers anyway Tell you what, Bob's your uncle. Why waltz when you can rock and roll? Okay, we've got this chip of wood glued on the end here, and I've come in with a sander and just knocked the big stuff off. Because what we're really going to want to know is where are we lining up here to here? Where are we lining up in the grander scheme of things? And man, we got pretty damn close. So this is just going to be a couple of kisses on a belt sander to bring this back till it's right there with this lined up. And we'll have it. And yeah, after I was done oiling this, I went ahead. There was still some acrylics that I hadn't kicked yet. I went ahead and filled that chip in. Um, so all that will just clean up nice. And then all that was that was missing here, we filled most of that in. This is all going to clean up pretty well. When we're all done, you probably won't know what we're doing. Okay, so I'm going to uh, go back to a belt sander kiss this off a little bit and then once I get this to the right length we're going to talk about how we're going to attach this piece to the big piece that goes gerbanging later. So the first thing I'm going to do before we do the duffel cut is I'm going to get mold release on the barrel. You can see here Bruno is taking a couple of shots here and we're just going to put the mold release on the barrel and we're going to use the barrel as a mandrel and give it something to strap to so we're not just up in the middle of thin air. Make sure you go all the way around because Murphy was an optimist. This was that big saw cut. Of course, what you're seeing in minutes takes hours of setup here in the shop because you have to wait for uh, all the epoxies to cure and there's a lot of stuff going on in here. You'll probably hear Ben over there. He's dynamiting all of the um, cosmoline off of a SMLE. Boy, them bricks were right proud of their stuff. They use, my God, did they use a lot of cosplay when they put them up. All right, here we go. I don't want to take too much off, but the reason why I'm doing this here is to show you that we're double using, we're double using the time, right? Cleaned it up on the inside there. And then that whole notch then becomes full of acrid glass. And once we get in here and scraper this down a little bit, and Bob can be your uncle on the front end, too. 
And now we've got this. We're even at the front, we're even at the back, all the way around. That sticks out. And the reason why we open this up, taking off that wood is because now we can take this, this nut, slide it up on there, and you can see that it's flush and that we can get the screw in it. The screw goes through it that way. Here, let me tighten that down here for a minute. But we're doing all this up in the air. We're not doing this after we glue it all together. So there you go. We're square here in the front. We're square here in the back. And we have this leveled off. So now we know we've, we've taken care of all of the missing wood. And by the time we oil this all down, this will disappear. You won't even know we did it. And we'll be gluing flush up against the back end of the stock here. So when this is, oh, sorry about that. I bumped the camera here. When this is all done, that's going to be back to looking like that again, you see. But it'll all be there. It'll all be right. Okay. So we got some holes to drill and some things to tap. We're going to reset the cameras here and move on to that. And you can see I've drawn this line through where the, the bolt hole goes to uh, hang on to that foreign metal. The bolt goes through there, right? So I've, I've marked off this line. I don't want to go here. So I want to go about halfway and drill an 832 hole. Now you would say, okay, he doesn't even have these on. You're right, I don't have them on. But what I'm going to say is, and we'll come down from the barrel channel. We're going to drill this hole right about here. And I'm just going to, I'm, I'm just going to come down and I've locked the carriage on this. My hand was in the way. And I know now that I'm going to want to put a hole right about where that dimple is. So we're going to look up at my chart and um at what the what the tap drill is for an 832 screw and it's a number 19 um or an 1160 for it's a work and that's what we're going to use um in order to drill this this hole so on my bench you see all these bins tap and die number eight tap and die number six that's because i don't have to go hunting what i need in order to drill a 632 hole Okay, we're going to need about a 960 fourths inch drill. So here we go. I got a 960 fourths inch drill. We'll pop this bad boy out, run this bad boy in, and all we're going to do is drill, drill a tap drill hole. Now, I don't care exactly where we are on center line, and I'm going to show you why here in a minute. The other thing we're going to do is we're going to pop a hole right up here in the barrel channel. And that's a glue escape hole because we need to let the air out of this. Okay. Don't drill all the way through the bottom of this thing. I, I just it needed saying. You know why. All right. We'll pop my air tool off there. Go back to this. And we'll just see if we're all the way through. Nope, we're not. We're not all the way through yet. There we go. Now we went through. There we go. Okay, that way we don't hydraulically lock. So that looks like this here. So I just got a little hole in there. It'll be full acroglass when we're done, so who cares, right? So once we get that in, and this A32 doesn't fit, we're just going to take a tap and tap down into it. So we'll just dig out an 832 tap here. And that looks like one right there. So let me get a tap wrench and we'll go ahead and swing that. Doesn't mind how clean of a tap that is, but this now threads down into that, and this will thread down about halfway, and we'll pop it down in. Now we've got the distance set in the barrel channel, and we'll go take a look at that. So as you remember, we had measured down from the barrel channel, and we know that the center line of the hole that we're going to drill 
has got to be right about there. And I mean about there because we don't care if we're right on the money here. This is going to be a big hole. And it's going to be larger than, than the screw that we just put in. Here, let me get the right drill bit here. Okay. So if it did this right, this thing will slide down onto that. We got to make the screw a little bit shorter. This will slide down onto that and I'll have enough wiggle room here to get this where I want it. I know I need to come over a little bit. Bang, and that's gonna sit right there. Well, it's gonna have to get held there. But that's gonna sit right there and that's gonna be our duffel cut right there that's our glue joint then we'll strap the barrel into this so i'm going to mix up another load of acro glass we're going to slop it on this screw put it all in here i don't need a glue escape hole here because i have room around the outside you see so all i got to do is make sure i get a little bit down in there swish it around get this jammed up in and then we'll have a threaded metallic fastener carrying the load across this joint and we won't be asking this glue joint to hold all this load, you need to be able to grab this gun by the foreign and pick it up. Success will be if we can bounce this stock um, on the table when we're done with it. And I'll show you what success looks like. This is a Mauser stock that we've also done a, a foreign cut on. And this thing bounces, you see. And when it bounces, then you know that it's absolutely tight. And that's going to be the success we're looking for. This stock is hurting, man. This thing is broke all over the place. But this particular Mauser is now wearing a brand new Lothar Walther barrel. And um, hmm, yeah, I need to do some woodwork. All right, let me get some glue mixed up. We've got our hole drilled there. We've got our hole drilled here. We'll take the um, acro glass here that I've just prepared. And I'm going to roll the screw in it here. Let me, let me get my hands out of the way. I'm just going to roll the screw in it. Okay, because we know that this is a zero depth hole. So we'll just keep pressing some acro glass down into it. And I'm working out here at arm's length, but right, we just want to get a bunch of it out in front of this, this uh, screw when we put it in a hole. That's going to go in there, and I'm just going to turn the screw in. It doesn't have to be any kind of major effort. It just needs to be that. Now I can see something you cannot see, which is a very small dollop of black glue that's right down inside that hole there. So I know now that I have been successful at squeezing the glue all the way down into the bottom of that hole. So all I'm doing now is just finishing the, finishing putting this in here. So now we have a we have a metal bridge now that's going across. Remember earlier we took the mold release and put it all over. So now I have the bottom metal screw in. This gun is so complete it's even got its lock screws, which makes it amazing. So I've got the action screwed down on the barrel, and I'm going to use the barrel, right? Well, what what about you know barrel harmonics and all that other stuff? Are you kidding me? We're not really sweating barrel harmonics, guys. We're just going to be lucky if this gun goes off. I doubt anybody is going to be using it in a 600 yard across the course match. Okay. Because we have mold release on the barrel, we can get a little bit of glass on this barrel and it's not going to kill us. Okay. So there we go. We're out to the edge there. And as I said before, we need to butter both sides. So we have to be able to come all the way up here get all this and then we're also going to get a copious amount and I'm sorry I'm off camera I'm over my tray 
I'm going to get a copious amount of glue dolloped on the back end of that. You see that? And then we just plug this into that. Here we go. That's us right there. Now, i got to make sure that we're flush here. And we are. And that we're flush over there. And we are. Bruno's giving me the thumbs up. He's looking longitudinally and telling me I got it. Okay. So while I'm pushing on that, this is the all hands evolution here. I'm gonna use a little bit of rubber. Okay, here I got the uh, the monitor wire is what you see. I'm looking at this in a monitor so I can see what you see. I'd really like to not have the camera rig become part of the duffel cut. Okay, that's got to go right there, and then that will lay on like that. I know, we're going to have to rotate it. We're going to have to come back the other way. That's what's going to have to happen. Because it is twisted a little bit. And that means I need to come back this way and put a little bit of tension on it the other way so that that will square up and stay square. And there it is, we got it. Okay. There we go, I got it. All right, so this jury rig deal here is putting an enormous amount of tension on this. And now I'll just play with it and make sure that it stays right where I want it. And there it is. So I'm in tight. I'm pulled down this way. And that's got to set. This isn't one I'm going to push. I'm not going to put this, push this under heat. I'm not going to do any of that. I'm just going to leave it alone. And it's going to sit here overnight. And the next time you see this, we'll take the band off it, clean it all up, and uh, make it look decent. Outstanding. Okay. We have other things to do. We have a dented magazine. Let's go take a look at that. If you drop a gun part in this, you're done. So while it's nice to clean up when you're done with a job, you really need to sweep it before you begin. Because I'm gonna tell you what, if you dropped a pin or a screw in this mess, you're not in a good place. Ask me how I know that. You know, you might be able to see if we sight down a long axis here. There's a slight bend there, but this isn't what's really going to get me. This was obviously dropped. And what are we going to do about that? I don't know. This was not a piece of spring steel. This is. If you bend a spring, when you bend it back, you might crack it. So in our case, not. So I'm just going to take a piece of square stock here. And I'm going to attempt to see what this looks like if we try to bend that back a little bit. Okay, that took some of the bend out of it. Now we can crawl up in even further here. I'm sorry if my fingers were in the way, but notice I'm not whacking on this thing with a hammer. I'm not whacking on this with a hammer. This is folded over. So if I do this wrong, I'll lose that fold and it won't slide up on the lips of the box here. It slid off, but it doesn't slide all the way on. Okay, so that's quite a lot of tension. Okay, I can probably do this. Okay, so now I've taken a lot of that curl out. But I've got to get up inside. So the question becomes is how do you apply the force? Where do you apply it? And how do you get it out? So here we go. We'll go in this way. And we won't take the spring with it. And we'll see what we can come up with here. Nope. This is going to require me to bang on it with a hammer. And I really didn't want to do that. But in that particular case, we would get, hand me that great big piece of square stock right there. Yeah. We'll support this back here like this and pound into it. Okay. I'll get my hands out of the way here in just a minute, honestly. These are the decisions, though, that you're having to make when you're smithing stuff like this. And the trick here is to not tear up more than you fix. 
We don't want to do that. Okay, so if we come right there like that. Oh boy, that made some headway. You see that unwrinkling there. Now I'm going to get a cold chisel and persuade this a little bit. And I can get away with this because I'm hitting it into something solid. Yeah, it's moving. So, if I don't want to pound that curl down, I need to come underneath this. So I've got the wrong chisel. I'm going to go for one with a little more angle to it. Don't be afraid to modify tools. You see how I have this on here? This nose is not sharp. I have this nose rounded over because I don't want to cut anything. But now I'm in a place where I can sneak up under that rolled part. Kind of try to massage that back. Believe it or not, I'm actually getting away with that. I don't want to get weird with this. It doesn't need to be perfect, but it needs to slide all the way back onto the box. It needs to come all the way up on the box here. Um, am I doing that backwards? Yeah, I'm doing that backwards. So it needs to come all the way up on the box here. We'll get my little two ouncer and we'll just massage this in here. See, now that just snapped all the way on. And I'm going to tell you, between you, me, and the wall, I'm done. Because anymore, you can actually see there that silver line. That's where the nose of the chisel was actually hitting it. This is as soft as a piece of double bubble. And I don't want to hit it hard enough that I cut the actual box in half. But that's not too bad. We'll roll that back over a bit. So hang on here. We'll just... And let's see, I need a piece of spring steel. So hold on one moment. Okay. So I need this piece of spring steel here. And I'm just going to... I'm not even hitting it that hard. I'm just swinging the hammer like this. And folding that back over. Now let's see what we got here. Let's see what we got here. I'm getting pretty close here. One. Bruno's kind of giving me hand signals because he can see things that I can't see. Um, what I need is a punch. Whoa, big white old white t-shirt blur. Okay, I'm going to run this up over the edge of that. Okay, now that's down and that's locked. That's fairly straight there and it's not all beat up. And the, 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 I guess the least we could do here is maybe polished hammer faces, guys. Not bad. So we're there. So that completely dented in piece of mag box is now back in service. We're not really worried about the little wrinkle in the wall. And then we can recombine it with this epic magazine spring. And I mean epic. So that goes in there like this. And then you take this little, this little latch gizmo here stick it in there and now the magazine is ready to just become part of the bottom metal of a Mauser. So now I'm going to try to unroll this in a way and the the rubber hose here is trapped here so I'm going to have to flip the gun over in order to get it out but let me see if I can not get this to come apart to the point where we can get the action out. Ah, let's get out of there. This rubber is incredible stuff in that it puts a fabulous amount of load. Okay. Here we go. So you see we're kind of trapped here. So what I just need to do is get a sharp chisel and just kind of cut that free. We'll see if we can bump this free and preserve this rubber. 
We'll just, you can hear it clicking and ticking. And if I, you know, if I lose the rubber, I lose it. I'm not sweating it. Here we go. There we go. So now we got the rubber off of it. All right, so for right now, if we're lucky, this thing didn't stick to the action. I need a screwdriver. All right. So we'll take the action screw out here, pop that out, kick that off there and see if we got lucky. Oh, we did. Look at that. The barrel just fell free. So that means we didn't have any interactions. Nothing got stuck on the barrel. That is good news. Okay, so we'll pop this out and take a look. And we can see now that this is smooth through here, smooth over the top there. And we get the glue joint. Now this all has to be cleaned up. And it's just going to be a matter of... Uh, knocking this stuff off the top here. So let's see what we got. We might get lucky and just be able to just pop that right off. See how that just flicked off? And then, okay, bang. Now you gotta be real careful you don't drive this chisel into that end grain and it'll just lift that right off. So you got to do a stop cut here. And you heard that little click and that little click was that popping and now we can get right back up to where it should be. You just keep going like this. Now, when I did this, I left just a little bit extra walnut on here because these barrel bands are always loose so you want to leave yourself the option of having to remove just a tad of walnut all right so you notice I'm not in a big hurry but I'm gonna roll this up and show you what we got here and there you go there you have it we're smooth all the way to the back now this looks like this looks like high holy Hades here, but it really isn't. It's once we get in with this scraper and we pull this out, all that wood that was missing has now been replaced by glass. Now let me get the, there it is right there. That's the shot and it cleans up. I'll get all the way back around and then get the rest of this stock scraped down and we can start reintegr reintegrating all of these pieces let me get this so the glare isn't on it there you go this is a really white piece of wood we're going to take the finish off this entire stock we don't have a choice but we're not cutting into the wood here we're just removing the finish so we'll go all the way around set back in and this okay now we can handle the weapon from the front we know we got a screw across it the rest of this is just standard refinishing um, and then we've still got to conserve this entire action, all right? I didn't show you my fight with the nose metal. The nose metal took me a full hour to figure it out, and it was bent. So bad that you can see the little bit of rust on it here. I had to get this hot because you see that tear right there, right at the end of my index finger. That little tear right there, this had been bent and flexed down this hinge line so many times that this thing was getting ready to rip and I just had to put a lot of heat on it. And as it is, it's very, very difficult to open and shut, but I might have saved it. Um, this is next level stuff here to bend this back because this thing had been, it literally looked like it had been run over by a car or... Um, you know, sat on by an elephant. I don't know. Maybe the Germans were using it down in Africa for all I know. As I showed you on the handguard now, we've gone through and pulled all of that 
I don't know what the heck that was, that varnish. We pulled it off. We are very light. We didn't get into the wood here. And lots of detail got preserved in this stock. It came out great. Our duffel cut is done now in the middle of all this. And note that I have oil down into the barrel channel. This piece of walnut is then grain on so that its strength is this way. There's a rod through it. And as I showed you before, the stock um, does bounce. Same deal with the handguard. Nice and light. I didn't take any of the character marks out. All I did was I took that layer of gack off the top of it, um, put a couple of coats of oil on it, and that's it. I don't want to seal it up. I don't want to make it look like it's got a modern high-speed finish on it. We used acro glass here to plug this, to plug that gash where they tried to cut it. You can actually see where the saw went in, and uh, they were so intent on making that cut that up here on the barrel, there's actually a nick where that saw would actually touch the barrel. It didn't really damage the barrel. Um, while I'm up here, I'll show you that this thing cleaned up beautifully. I'm very happy with how this barrel cleaned up. This was just a standard boil it in water conservation that I've got an entire uh, section of videos on. Um, so I'm not gonna go back over it here. I know I covered the duffel a little bit differently. I've done three different kinds of duffel cut repairs. Um, and I just wanted to show the duffel cut again and how to do some other stuff. Let's look at the rest of the metal and see how that tightened up. The butt plate, people are gonna tell me that it should be in the white or blue. But I'm telling you, when I got the tanks hot and I'm rust bluing, I blew everything. And then as individual owners, it's very easy to remove bluing. It's a pain in the butt to put on. So I blew everything. I blew all the screws, although I didn't turn them purple because purple screws look out of place on a German World War I gun. The magazine, you saw us straighten it up. So then I went back in, completely conserved this. And I'll have to admit to the fact that I did a little bit of rust bluing on the edges here where it had come off. Where it had come off. And you look at the mag and you don't know that I've messed with it. This is the bolt uh, release and um, the, the spring-loaded part that sits over the outside of it. This is the actual ejector here. So you're holding in the bolt and doing ejector work at the same time. Rear sight. So what we're really doing here is clean, oil, and inspect. So I'm inspecting this rear sight, and I note the fact that there, this probably showing up pretty well here. Note the fact that there's a bend here. Well, the problem with this is that's thin enough. That little bend was enough to work hard in it. So we can bend this back down ever so slightly, but we're gonna put a torch on it to do it. Uh, trigger and sear. Okay, we've got a, a, one of the through pins through here, but the through pin that was holding the trigger on was broken into two pieces. We'll need to fabricate another one of those. Um, the entire bolt group, we're fine. The, the, the firing pin had the slightest little wobble to it. Um, so I took that wobble out. You can still see there's a slightly, a slight axial misalignment there, but we're gonna leave that alone. It goes through and it's just fine. Bottom metal, Bottom metal was actually in pretty good shape. A little bit of pitting here, but I've never seen a World War I German gun that have a little bit of pitting on the mag box. This nose metal was hosed, and I mean hosed. It was crunched, it was a lot of things. And one of the things I had to do was put heat on this joint because the vertical line that's formed by that piece of metal, this thing was all the way over here. So it had rotated, the rotating part had turned that way. And in the act of doing this, and I don't know how blown up we are, but there's a crack here and a crack there that had already started to form. I'm telling you, I put a lot of heat on this thing, turned this whole thing red and went ahead and moved it. This is the pin that locks all of this together. And this pin had the king of the bends in it.
That was a lot of fun. Original sling. Um, I don't know. This says 1942 on it. So this part here is an original, but it's close enough. We're going to go ahead and hang it on the back end of the gun anyway. Um, just till we took this sling off the other kar 980 z that's in here, but that other one is so far gone cosmetically. We're going to turn that into a shooter and this into his shower. Um, there were some results of this um, inspection part, and let's pop over to the big vise and deal with that rear sight. So this is the piece that was bent, and I'm going to capture this here in the vise. Thin pieces of metal off 100-year-old guns are things to be taken care of. We're just going to heat that up a little bit, and then you'll see here, let me kill this. You'll see that the color of the flame turns orange when we begin to get it good and hot. I'm not worried about drawing a temper on this. This isn't spring steel. You see that little bit of orange lick in there? And then all I'm going to do is just tap on this ever so slightly. And there it is. It's straight. But it's straight and it didn't bend. And it will cool off at a slower rate. We'll just control the rate at which it cools off at. I'm going to hand the torch over here to Bruno. And then I'm going to grab a, a pair of pliers. And we're just going to dunk this in some oil here. And then that will be the reason why I dunked it in the oil is to just keep it from flash rusting. You black powder guys know exactly what I'm talking about, flash rust. I have two stocks here. One, two, an American uh, 1873 trapdoor. And one, two, you know, the AZ. And if you take a look at this, you'll see that the, that check does not go across. It's just a, it's a check. It's not with the grain. And I'm going to tell you, I don't want to fill that in because it'll be very obvious if we did. I'm going to leave it alone. But the point I want to make, the reason why I've got both stocks here, is the ends of these stocks are really fragile. So when you're going to put these guns together, the very first thing you want to do is put any nose or rear metal back on first. Don't torque that screw quite yet. As I mentioned in the trapdoor episode, the distance from here to here is a lot less than the distance from here to here. So the first one you torque down is always the short one, and that lifts this gap. And then you can come back in and tighten down and pull that gap out with a lot more leverage, and then you don't have to hit the, hit the screws quite as hard. And then I just give the screws a little tap, that does two things. If you raise the burr on a screw slot, it beats it down. And then it also gives you just a little bit more torque right there. Oh, look at that. See that? Okay, this is how you lose parts off the bench. This is why I detest magnetic tools, but I put up with them for my screwdrivers. This, I did not plan this. I literally drug that sight part that we just did off the bench you got to be very very careful that when you come up you're not losing screws you're not losing things you got to pay attention when you're working with magnetic anything you see all the gack stuck to the end of this screwdriver yeah this is an extreme case but magnetized things on the workbench pick all of this stuff up off the bench and deposit it inside your uh, action deposit it up against your finishes and scratch up your finishes. Yeah, I keep a magnetizer on the front of my bench specifically to not deal with that. So magnetized parts trays are not a part of this shop. These Brownell screwdrivers are amazing and I'm not sponsored and I put up with them only because they're convenient as all get out and I like the metal they make their, their tips out of. But other than that, magnetized stuff on a workbench is a pain in the... Okay, so having redone that part, there's something I want to show you, and I think I know why it was bent. There's a big end of this thing, and there's a little end to it. And this is supposed to slide through big end to little end, okay? And it'll do that until you put this spring in it, all right? And here's the issue. If you just set, you got to run that in first here. So let me get my fingers out of the way and I'll show what I'm talking about. 
you got to run that in first and then if you insert the spring into the body this thing will jam up and you have to bend it to try to get it together what i'm here to tell you is there's a little step in this thing let me get it down on the aluminum you see that step right there this spring has to be put in and set down under that step now Bruno was able to easily swoop down and pick this part up. Why? Because we swept the damn floor. Okay, so here we go. That spring has to be trapped under that step or else this will not slide together. It'll bind. So that goes in there. Bang. There it is. It's spring loaded, you see. Well, there's that little bind I was talking about, actually. We have to talk we have to tuck that into that spring up underneath that yeah okay so you see the angle this thing's taking there's that little bit sticking out you can see that silver line there that's because the spring popped off of that detent you can't just stuff this thing up in the hole let me get my fingers back out of the way a very finger intensive evolution here okay so now i've got the spring trapped again and we'll run that in and maybe we'll get lucky and it'll come down yes i think so a little tap here i'll hang on a minute here i'm going to use my universal work holding system to just kind of press that together okay so now that i've pressed that together now it's spring loaded you see so just important to note that if you're having to force something like this something's gonna bend and it will all right rear sight after I blued it, I polished the top of it ever so slightly with some 800 grit sandpaper. And it just took the heavy bluing off of it. You can see it's kind of silver. I'm looking at it in a monitor and this is actually a true color representation. And you can read the numbers. So you're going, well, which end of this thing is up? Is that up or is this up? Well, typically when the sight's down, you're going to be looking at the back of the groove with the cut away from your eye. So having said that then, we know that that's going to be down and you're going to need to see through it. I got a phone call, I had to go away. That's why the fade right there. So you see the side with the teeth on it here? Those are the side with the teeth. And up inside here, you can see that the teeth, let me get this right. When I press in on it, you see that tooth retracting? So that means we got to go top up like this, retract and slide that thing on and it locks in place, all right? Again, the rear sight is an analog computer. So now we're gonna put this on the gun, and typically what I do is I fabricate all of the sub-assemblies first. Epic rear sight spring, okay, we've got that. So, that leads me to other things that we can put back together again. So this is the ejector bolt hold open or the bolt retention device. And we have this, this is the spring the top is, and then this spring is integral with this. So we gotta be very, very careful with that spring so we don't break things. And we're looking at this end of it here and it's got a slot and we're looking at this end of it here. So it's pretty obvious that this has to go together this way. Let me get the light right here. There we go, there it is. That's got to slide in. Now I'm pushing down on this while I'm doing it and sliding that up, all right? But you're going to run into a problem. This is actually going to run into this crossbar. The end of this spring is going to run into this crossbar. So here's how I get away with that. You just trap, the, trap a screwdriver sticking up like that in the universal work holding system. Bring this through and you can see now I can push up on this while I'm pushing in and I'm going to have to actually tap on it here with a hammer for just a second to move it a little bit further you hear that tink at the very end that's that running into this bar so now I can just push up on this and shove this the rest of the way in as with most things most things gunsmithing related nothing is ever simple I can push up on that and just pop that in there like that and now that's ridden up over the top. Bam, and I'm down. 
That's how I get around it. Use the vise. Use your tools. Cut them if you have to. Here, uh, let me show you an example of a tool I had to modify. What happens if you have to put the left-handed barrel nut on a Hotchkiss? Well, you take a crescent wrench and you grind it to the right profile. This is $20, maybe $30 of the kit, and you're working on $20,000 worth of gear. Modify your tools as necessary to do what you need to do. The last part of this is going to be to insert the actual um, ejector part in there, and it just pops down in there. Now, these ingenious guys, when you go to put this gun together, they gave you this really sharp tip screw so that as this goes in, it collects it collects all that as you drive it in and it will allow it to just go in when you pop on it. I'll show you that when we put the rest of the gun together. All right, there you go. That's a trigger for the uninitiated. This is the sear. These two bumps right here on a military trigger, in case you're wondering, you see the two bumps on top? This picks up first and gives you a lot of travel, but it's easy. And then that will run in and make the leverage difficult at the end. I happen to like two-stage triggers. I know a lot of people that absolutely detest the things. Um, but in our particular case, here we go. We're going to insert the pin through and just pop that together. Um, here we go. Again, that fade was there because my fingers got in the way and you know how that works. Okay, when we took this gun apart, um, I had noted that there was a broken pin in it and that's broken right there. So we'll just come in and get a quick onesie twosie number on it. 0.1185, we can go to eighth inch, okay three millimeter all right it's a german gun this is three millimeters so now what i gotta do is go to my little thing full of pins so while i'm working in the shop i've got a thing full of pins and then i've got another one that says springs on it i got a lot of other things so every time i break a drill bit or i break something right i drop it in this tub so now what i'm gonna do i doubt i have any three millimeter stock in here 3.17 that's a little big I don't know I might get lucky 3.14 I'll root through here until I find 3.45 that's not us 2.3 so now I've got a pile getting up here too big too small and I'll just keep rooting through here before I'll go cut up a perfectly good piece of stock aha look at that Oh man, it's almost like that was made for that. All right, so I'm not gonna really worry about cutting this to length that I'll get it up inside the gun. So that'll be the next thing we'll do is we'll just put it on. Here we go. Again, notice I've got non-ferrous vice jaws here. <sighs> get that little bit of schmutz out of there. Trigger return spring. What's important is we don't have any slop in here and somebody hasn't tried to grind this down to get a better trigger pull. The bolt, when it goes in, is very sloppy. It just kind of walks in and you want this very well captured. And there was a lot of things that had been written, said, and done during the 1950s and early 1960s about lightening the trigger pulls on these guns, which is just suicide. If the sear has been modified, my personal recommendation to you is going to be to go get another one and here we go let's let's get that up in there notice it's just an old broken drill bit right okay this is captured and then all i'll do is i'll come in with a dremel tool no way nick that off here i'll i'll, I'll do that here in just a second all right Bruno's got this up here. I'm going to roll this just a little bit so we can see better. The bottom of this spring has a distinct curve in it, which tells us that that rides down in there, right? Or does it? Does it ride here? Yes. So trust me, if it looks right, it probably is right. 
little bit of oil because this thing hasn't seen the light of day in a long, long time. So a little bit of oil, a little bit of the magic smoke. Yes. And blow on it like that. Okay. Spring inserts. Give it a little bit, little bit of tightness there. Now, these tabs, let me take this back out again. These tabs have to slide in and up. Did you see that motion? And I'm showing you this because a lot of guys that are, even the people that are really into these guns, sometimes have never taken one of these this far apart. That pops up into that recess. So in order to take it out, we had to push down and pull to the rear. That's where this three-headed hydra comes in right here because you're having to do all that against a very strong spring. We have to push this all the way down and in. So I'm at a little bit of a disadvantage here for body position, but I'm going to try to do this. I'm going to cut in front of y'all here for just a second. And I'm going to bend that bad boy down. Now, you could say we could transfer the load. Uh, i got to keep that straight. We could transfer the load to the trigger and push in from the rear. Now, I don't know if you just saw that, but I had all eighth of a ton of me shoving down on that. And I think around the corner of my arm, you actually saw that thing ride up underneath. Okay? That has to be an epic spring because it doesn't have a lot of... Uh, mechanical advantage to work with. This particular site has these eeny weeny little screws. Normally this is just a pin that drives through here to hang on to it, but it's not coming out anyway. Here we go. I put this other screw over here. It's not coming out anyway because it's got all that spring pressure putting up on it. However, if that spring breaks, this site is still useful if the rear leaf is with it. And for those of you that don't think that can happen, you know, Murphy's Law says that it will happen at the worst possible time. And then I like to add my dad's adage is, Murphy was an optimist. Remember now, this is an analog computer. And for a given input, here's the input. It will give you an output that moves the launcher to a pre-dedicated angle that says on some day, somewhere 130 years ago in Germany that that, um, that that eight Mauser was gonna hit somewhere. We've covered this before, but I just wanted to bring it back up because there's a lot of guys that never thought about it as an analog computer. So ejector and then the part that holds the bolt in is this, right? Uh, that surface right there is what holds the bolt in. Well, all this, there's a spring in there. So this is difficult to line up right and get it all to go back in. Cue the pointy-headed screw. And what the pointy-headed screw is, is a lot like this all that I've turned into a spud. It lets you get in there and line everything up, right? Okay, so let me get out in front of this here. There we go. Put up with the light. It lets you see what the heck we're doing. You shove that in there, and if you're in the field... And you can't reach in there to line all that up. This pointy-headed screw, if you just wiggle it, grabs everything. And then it also um, um, does some work down inside the stock. But they put a place down here. That screw is going to stick out the bottom. You see it? But this now hangs onto the bolt. All right? So that's it. There's not much to this thing. That's the beauty of it. Okay. So that brings me to the bolt, and we're going to look at this bolt from two different ways. There's something about this bolt that you shouldn't do. You never take this clip off. And I know there are tools for it, but these clips, are, are, are they break. Just don't take it off. Well, if you roll up on a surface of this bolt, you can see this track right here by my thumbnail. And that track is what the nose of the extractor rides in right there. We'll look at it in profile here. I'll get it on something blue. You see that nose right there? Rides in that track. So to assemble this thing, we'll get that clipped up inside there and the nose of this popped up just a bit. We have to lift, and you are bending 
an expensive, hard to get spring. Line that, line this up right here with that slot and roll it. And I don't know how practical it is to take this thing apart in the field by taking this off. You can get to everything you need to clean. So they probably shouldn't have taken this off. But the rest of the bolt was designed to be taken apart in the field. Allow me to demonstrate. I'm not trying to be pedantic here, but I'm talking to people 20 and 30 years from now that have never seen this done and don't know how this goes together. There is a set of interrupted, they're not threads, but they're interrupted on the back of this that goes into the caulking piece. It can't go all the way because it's, it's round back here, okay? So to put this thing together, we're gonna need to shove this all the way in and rotate it 90 degrees. But we have this to contend with while we're trying to do it. Before we introduce the spring, let's look at the rest of it here. We have the back, the bolt shroud, and then the takedown um, uh, device and the safety. This round hole here, uh, let me get that right there where you can see it. This half round hole engages like that and that's what holds it in. The disassembly position is straight up and down. That's something that's important to remember. This hole here is only gonna let us put the firing pin through one way. So the firing pin's gonna have to go through and not be allowed to rotate, right? This is important later because what we note is, is that as the bolt is rotated, this fixture right here is what keeps the firing pin from touching the primer unless the bolt is rolled all the way into position. So once that's in, that mainspring will be compressed between here and here, and then we'll need to be able to put this on the back all the while we're holding against that spring force, okay? So it looks kind of like this. All right, hang on here. We're gonna wanna stop right here so that that can go all the way in. All right, do I got the light right? Yeah, I do, right there. So that that can go all the way in, all right? So let's do this and I'm gonna show you what this appliance is for. We're gonna put the mainspring on this. And in order to assemble this, we're going to need to have some place solid in a soggy area to push down on. And that's what that little hole right there is for. This then will come down over the top of that. And then we have a place we can push this all the way down and pop that stem out. Put this on rotate it until it sticks in, right? So in reverse, this looks like this. If you've got this bolt and it's dirty, you come down, right? Rotate, lift, and it comes apart. Down, assemble, rotate, bang. When you're done, try to have the flag sticking straight up. It will make your life simpler at the end. But that's what that little gizmo is in the back of a Mauser stock. And a lot of People don't know that. All right, we're just gonna give this a little shot of some uh, assembly lube here. A Little bit of Lucas gun oil. Again, I'm not sponsored. I just use this stuff because it works and it works really well. Okay, so this will now rotate on. And then there's a spring-loaded stop here. Okay, that will rotate up, will go around one more time. So if the bolt is open, That'll hold it open and then you can rotate it back out again, okay? That's what we are right here. The bolt shoulder has stopped up against it. We have the disassembly device in the vertical position and that's gonna make sticking the bolt in this gun rather easy because all we have to do here is stick this in. You'll note that this device is what was holding the bolt up from coming forward and then you put that in, drop it, and either take it to a position where it can be fired or to a position where the gun's in safe. And there it is. And the way that works, as this is disengaged, that bolt moves to the rear just ever so slightly. You see that? And that movement to the rear takes it off the nose of the sear and does not allow it to drop. Always do the safety check pull the trigger out of safe, and then take the gun over to fire and make damn sure this thing doesn't drop. That's a bench check you need to do.
you have to get over you have to get over the front sight first and then stick this in and get the action to sit down always pop the rear sight up come over and rotate you don't want to know how many of these things I've seen broken because people don't realize that or when this is in let me show you what really gets it they try to pull this thing out when it's down you see what I'm saying and then you just ring it off don't be that guy sling swivel is typically always on the left side of the gun because I got news for you everyone in the military is right-handed right okay that screw goes right through the duffel cut and we'll secure that and now we're kind of in a position where we're good now I'm not gonna put the nose metal on yet and you did all that work on the duffel cut and this is slightly loose you're damn right this is loose don't zero zero these hand guards out or you'll get a bow in them if you get them hot just let it all rattle around what we want to do though is make sure it all stays with the gun okay and in this particular case we break this loose flip it over because now the barrel's trapped and we can throw the bottom metal on it don't torque any fasteners yet all we're doing is just popping on the bottom metal short bolt goes up forward long bolt goes to the rear and I'm not even using a full-size screwdriver I'm just walking these up because you don't want to drag the torque up on these guns all at once I know there are dedicated guys that reenact with Mausers that think I'm full of it I'm just a gunsmith what the hell do I know okay now that we have all that in now we can go back up to the uh, to the nose metal we don't even have to get these tight we just got to get them close that plugs in this way and it goes in righty tighty lefty loosey it will go in easily this way if you try to come at this this way and come around it does not want to do that so every one of these that I've messed with it's righty tighty now this stacking swivel has to go on first because it's going to be trapped by the nose metal that will slip over now I'm gonna flip the gun over because I want to show you something here am I still in the center there brother all right this screw that we showed you before had been badly mauled this entire front end had it, it looked like somebody hit it with a hammer I kid you not it was it was scrunched down there were uh, like I told you before there were a lot of marks in it there is a retention surface right here that is going to sit down in this because what happens when you fire this gun which way does this nose metal want to go it wants to go that way but the nose metal doesn't move the gun takes off that way and that little surface in there makes sure that the the nose metal takes off with it there we go now we're in the threads run that down on this okay that's now tight and the whole front end of this gun is buttoned up tight it's buttoned up tight we're on here we got a little bit of slop in this which is exactly where I want it I don't want this at zero zero I'm sure there are plenty of people that are going to tell me I'm wrong that's fine I'm willing to have that conversation but don't just go you're wrong you're all screwed up and we're supposed to think you're such a great guy hey London gunsmiths remember that so that brings me to the topic of these little these lock and screws right here and I know that's out of focus just humor me here I'm going to get this run in these locking screws the way they're set up they do not need to be taken all the way out of the gun in order to disassemble it so that little half moon gizzy right there when it lines up allows you to rotate the big screw so you don't need to take this out all you need to do is see and that's all the way tight so we back that off just a little bit and then you take this screw and run it down and bang that's it these screws get lost so often that there were guys back in the 80s and the 90s buying entire rifles just to get these two screws I think we know a better way um, so let me go ahead and put the one in up front see okay we'll just bring that around and allow that to do 
locking noises right there. These do not need to be Gorilla tight. They just need to be tight enough so that they don't fall out. So then that brings me to the mag here. One of the things about a Mauser is that the feed lips on a Mauser are integral with the action, not with the mag. So this gun was never really designed for a detachable box mag. So what they did was is they made what amounted to floor metal out of it. It's got a lip here that hooks and then a hook then that goes over this plunger right here. So in order to put it in, you put it in and you leave it in. You put this down, push down, push down. And then you'll see here, that'll go down and forward. And that snick you heard was that button popping up. Now that that's in, you can pull this out. That lets the follower pop up underneath the bolt and stow the key here in its, in its stowage position. And that is a K98AZ. Very important. Rust, Cosmoline, a heavy coat of oil, they're all bore obstructions. Pull the snake at least once till you can see that the bore is clear of rust or anything that makes it subcaliber. That's important, and I mean important. All right, I got my glasses. Let's get this thing outside and pop a couple, huh? Just remember, always check for bore obstructions. You cannot shoot things out of a bore. You will hurt yourself, you will break the gun, don't do that. So I've got this thing put back together again. It's World War I, it's a hundred and something years old, but it is what it is. Um, it's stripper load, it, Bruno, hand me, hand me some ammo here. I need, a, I need an end block here. Heh, <laughs> smart ass. With the bolt all the way back, you should be able to just insert rounds down into this mag. Now, I don't know how easy that's going to be, but it's a 20 round mag, and the normal capacity for a Mauser is five. So the fact that I'm even to do any of this at all is a freaking miracle. The, the Mauser feed lips are built into the gun. Um, so we don't have to worry about whether or not this is flopping around or not. All this thing is, is a container, uh, for eight Mauser. Injection is good and strong and it feeds great. I wasn't smart enough there on the ejection. You know, I could do this all day. I have that big mag, I actually can. Smart ass. The 1898 carabiner from about 1917, the AZ version of it, I don't understand. It's not quite as, it's a lot of work to not be a lot shorter, but I think this was a pretty good bring back from the pile of garbage that we had. And I hope I covered some things that maybe some people haven't seen before when it comes to this piece of kit. And just remember, check for bore obstructions. Older guns have different manuals of arms. I've said it before and I'll say it again. It has been a pleasure to help you guys out. Have a good one.